want want to see. I wouldn't really call this a stupid human trick, but you want to see something weird that I've always yeah learned about. Um, I'm so oily that I can just stick caps to my head. Oh, <laughs> hey, it fell off. But I, I feel like I can do that as well. Huh? I've always had like a real nice tackiness Sheen. to the yeah. yeah to the forehead. That's really great. That's a really <laughs> that's a good skill, right? That's yeah. Some, yeah. If, uh, do you have any stupid human tricks? I can sometimes do this. Hold on. That's pretty cool, right? I don't even know what you just did. Uh, you know, you flicked know the it snap off the wall. Yeah, flick it off the wall and catch it. Wow. I don't know. How did you get to become a part of Succession? Did the job land in your lap? Did you have to audition for it? What was that like? I definitely had to audition for it. It was. I wish it was like the more interesting story. I guess there's one bit that's interesting. It was sent to me to read for the part of Cousin Greg. Um, uh -huh. And I immediately got to who Cousin Greg was and I went, oh, that's not me. I couldn't do this, but I liked it enough to want to read on. I'm like, the writing's good, I'll keep reading, whatever. And then Roman walks in a room and his first line, which you won't be able to use on PBS, is, hey, hey, motherfuckers. And I went, who's this guy? And then I saw that he was kind of horrible, and I immediately loved his voice. And then by the end of the first episode, he uh, offers the kid a million dollars to hit a home run and gets to tear up this check in front of this poor kid. And I went, oh, that would be a really fun day of work. <laughs> to go for a small child, that would be great. And I asked if they were auditioning Romans, and the word I got back was they weren't yet. Uh, and I said, well, I'm just going to put myself on tape anyway. And I just picked three scenes and sent it in. And it was pretty much like, that was it. And I remember when I walked away from the audition, I remember thinking, like, I had so much fun doing that. Like, there are very few times when I think you get to really, really enjoy saying somebody else's words and being somebody else. And I had the best day that I was like, I don't even mind if I don't get it. I had a really fantastic day today. And then when I got the part, I was like, great, I get to do it for a few weeks. And maybe the, it gets picked up, or maybe it doesn't. I don't know. It was great. And at what point in that process did you realize that you were going to be a part of something that was that tra transcended what the script was, that became an entire world? I mean, it is such a gorgeous <laughs> show. It's beautifully directed. It's perfectly written. It's flawlessly acted. Uh, oh, wow. How early on in the process did you know that you were a part of something that was really kind of special and, and would have legs? A while. So now here's, I mean, I wouldn't say that I, I still even really have a sense of what you just said. I don't, I don't really know. I, I hear people say nice things about the show and I'm like, I don't know, it's a really fun Do film. you watch the show? I've, I've seen it and yes, I, I can't watch the show and walk away thinking like, eh, it's fine. It's not one I of think, those shows. I think the first few episodes, it is that. So I remember, even when I read it, I was like, it's very well written, and everybody that's involved, this is great, and the dialogue's great, and I'm having fun playing this part, but why would I really want to watch the show? That was really how I felt when we shot the pilot. Okay. And I saw it, and I remember thinking, great quality, great writing, it's shot wonderfully, I don't care about these people, I don't care. And then we got picked up, I thought, great, I get to keep being Roman. And that was sort of my attitude while we were shooting like episodes two, three, four, somewhere around like episode five, I came home, my wife asked me how work was, and I was like, good. And she was like, really? And I was like, I don't know what happened, but I sort of think we have something here. I just care about these people now, and I don't know why. And it felt validating, because that's how I felt when we read the scripts, when we shot it, and then when I watched the episodes, that's how I feel. It's not that it's bad at the beginning, it's just, uh, it just takes a while for you to like care, I guess. Uh, and I've well, I said think that's that inherently kind of the structure of the first season of any kind of television show. Is like, it's very rare to get those first few episodes feeling totally lived in because yeah. nobody yeah. knows sort of what's going on. So Even I if, I, like I you feel. Say again. Go ahead. No, you go. <laughs> no, I was saying I always admired. Uh, the the pilot, those first few episodes, and again, I think a lot of it is a testament to the casting, because I think even in terms of figuring out how things work from a writing standpoint, the writers were so lucky to have this cast of actors 
mm. inhabit these roles from such an early, you know, from day one, that it almost, you know, in my mind, as, a, as someone who's like writing TV, it's like, that's, mm. that's the gift, is knowing exactly who the voices of these people are, and it just makes it that much easier to write, too. That, that's exactly what it is, and actually, the moment we got picked up, by the time we got, uh, the script for episodes two and three, I was like, oh, they're writing Alan Ruck's voice right now. They are writing the way, I think Connor was supposed to be a completely different character and then Alan showed up with his stuff and they were like, let's make this guy. Um, right. They adapt really well. They're incredibly talented writers who also don't have insane egos to where like they'll make changes. If I have some sort of conflict or something I wanna say, I'm, they listen, they, I'm, I'm, I'm hurt, I get to, contribute. This is, you know, it's a collaboration. Uh, I mm -hmm. mean, it's it's their script, let's get real. Like, it's not like I bring that much to it, but um, <laughs> they, they, you know, because uh, that, that's something I've heard of other writers and other shows where they like, nope, this is the script, this is the story, and you've got to cram and you got to make it work. Like, make it fit that's in the, this That box. is the one question that I ask anyone who I meet who is a showrunner and any actor that I know that's on a show that I really love. And I think it comes from a place of just like fear because I think how can a show be this good and have that script be exactly as it is? And yeah. you know, I, I'm oftentimes relieved to hear from people that there is a level of um, malleability on set where if an actor has a, a, a thought or a feeling or a line suggestion that there is changes. Because I think to look at some of these shows and just think like, well, he sat down at his desk and that's what came out. It's like, well, I should just pack up and go home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no, it's I reassuring mean, to know. So like like on our show, the way it feels too, is it, feel, it feels collaborative in every department. It feels like every, I, like the props people will come in and have thoughts on like what the props should look like or be. And, it, and it's like, it's it really is sort of, it's a big, it's like, it takes a village to make a show like that. It's not just, but I mean, our, our, our showrunner, Jesse, he really is in charge. He is the captain. And it, it is what it is because of him. And his staff of writers and the guys. Okay. I mean, come on, you know how he is. He doesn't get it. He sells a plant out in the Philippines manufacturing Xerox machines. But he's fucking shrewd. And right now, right now his giant cyclops eye is looking in this direction and he's feeling like maybe he bought a giant pile of bullshit. Is your show Shit's Creek is Shit's Creek is it is it a lot like that because I can tell there's obviously yeah. because everybody in the cast there must be a lot of improvisation um is you you are you oh, so here's I want to actually preface this by saying I made a point which might be really stupid what I should have done was done my homework and really like researched you and all, all this stuff and looked in this show but I decided that I'm gonna go in completely blind not knowing anything because mm -hmm. there might be some people who watch this who don't know anything, who Fair can sort enough. of live, live it vicariously through me. So <laughs> I want to know how Shit's Creek started. How like you? How do you even like get a show with your father off? Like how does that start? Like how do you even begin uh, to make? Well, I brought him the idea, which at the time was kind of like a grain of a concept about a wealthy family who loses their money and an exploration of what happens to this wealthy family. And a lot of that for me was playing on this like collective consciousness we have now about how wealthy people live. I mean, it's all over reality TV and we have, we have this kind of intimacy into the lives of very wealthy people that I thought was worth exploring in a sort of satirical way. You know, what do these people look like when they have nothing? And that really became the grain or the sort of seedling that, that grew into the show. And then when we started researching how people lost their money, we stumbled across this um, article about uh, Kim Basinger, who had at one point bought a town as an investment and it didn't go to plan. And in our minds, we were like, what if this family bought a town? And then we started researching the fact that you can actually buy towns in, in North America for virtually no money. And, the fact that my dad thought it was funny to buy a town called Schitt's Creek for my 16th birthday and then to the, have our family end up there because it's the only <laughs> asset we have left. The minute that came into play was the minute that my dad and I both kind of looked at each other and said, I think we have 
an idea here that, that might stick. So um, it was really just like, a, you know, wanting to satirize and explore the level of wealth that we've all become accustomed to. And I think, you know, for me speaking about my show, our budget is the first two seconds of your show. Um, <laughs> kind of our examinations of wealth and what it does to people. I think my show is sort of like if your family on the show were to lose everything and really have to refigure their lives out and their priorities out, I'm almost like the after effect of what would happen to you guys. So, <laughs> you know, it's like hopefully they find love and the meaning of tr the true value of, of love and that it, it can't be bought. I don't know if that's the case with, with your cast <laughs> because those characters are really intense. Um, I think they'd be but, completely lost without money and power, yeah. I've been thinking a lot about it and I think you're right. I know. About what? Like, I think I'm wearing a wedding dress. Oh, I know that. I really wanted to impress you today, and now I feel like I'm ruining your wedding. My wedding was already ruined. But for what it's worth, I am continuously impressed by you. Watching uh, Succession, the, the sheer level of indulgence and the world that they have managed to create, the authenticity of a billion dollar lifestyle what is that like to play in? And do you find that it helps a lot in terms of figuring out your character or acting to be, you know, to like land in a helicopter or get driven by a boat to a yacht in the middle of the South right. of France? Like, what does that do to performance, if anything, or just general morale on set? Like, how much does that's, that world help? I don't, so that's interesting, because I'm not, I'm not one of these kind of, actors, I'm more like a belly guy. I'm like, yeah, uh -huh. Roman likey that go do. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the only thing that I can sort of say, like I, he doesn't understand any other world. This is what he was born into. And the sort of one choice that I made at the very beginning, which is still like the core thing of him, is that he's, because of the position he's been born into, he's never had to suffer any consequences. He can quite literally say and do whatever he wants, and he can always wiggle his way out of any problem. It doesn't matter. Um, so that's the only thing. Other than that, like, I don't... I never tried to get myself in the mindset of very wealthy people or anything. He's just right. Roman. This is all he knows. This is, it's like right. any other family dynamic. It just sort of has that backdrop. Um, but they're little things. Like you said, the helicopter, uh, they, they have um, consultants on set for, like, how very wealthy people live. And one of them was we did a take where we all got out of the helicopter and they told us, you know what, you would have been doing this your whole lives. You know where the propeller is. You wouldn't be ducking your head. Right. Uh, except unless your cousin Greg, who's, you know, like eight foot something. <laughs> 11 um, feet tall. Yeah, he, he, yeah. he does this. But I, that was one that's like have to, okay, get out. Another one was like, even in there winter, is a, you wouldn't Sorry, just to go back for a second. There is a wealth consultant. There's a consultant on set. I haven't actually met this person, but the writers talked to them. And, and this person is wealthy or just has spent their life observing wealth to the point where they can get paid to give their... That is a fascinating job. That is a fascinating job. Actually, come to think of it, I always assumed they were just a wealthy person who was like bored and was like, yeah, I'll help you with your little TV show, whatever. I'll probably buy it. <laughs> or it's somebody that's been exposed to that. I don't know. But, uh, but they say things, you know, there's cool ones where we do a fitting and we get there in the day and they're like, actually, they'll say something like, these people wouldn't have winter coats because they leave their building, they go into a car, they leave that car and go into their private jet. There is no like strolling wow. around. Like they would have one in their closet, but they would never use it or wear it to go to work. They're taken care of all day. That's um, wild. They put their clothes somewhere and then eventually when they go to work, when they come back, it's pressed and it's hung up. Like they don't, they don't do anything with their stuff. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's things a lot don't to take in. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one more question, just following up on like the world of your show. So the season finale, you're on the yacht. Does, do, do, do people rent the yacht? Who was on the yacht? Did people stay on the yacht? Where was the yacht? Talk to me about that last episode and wh and just how, what, how, what is that? So yeah, that yacht is, it was pretty incredible. I'm forgetting the name of it right now. What was it? It was a stupid name. 
Um, <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember. We were in Croatia, which was gorgeous, but uh, nobody, as far as I know, stayed on the yacht. Uh, but my, I, I can tell you, when we were shooting there, my wife was about seven months pregnant, seven or eight months pregnant, in Manhattan by herself in the summer, miserable, oh looking after two cats. And she saw me on a yacht, you know, in my wonderful clothes, sunglasses, sunbathing. And she was like, you, and when she was like really upset, she's like, I'm trying to read up all these things about, about babies, and then you're just on a yacht. I'm like, I'm not on a yacht, I'm on a set. Like, I'm, I'm working. I'm sure it's very you, nice. You have the worst, particularly the worst job right now for having someone at home with a baby. It doesn't exactly. matter what you say, you are still on a hundred million dollar yacht in the middle of Croatia. This is true. That and also, I made the mistake of the day I got there, I was told, because a lot of our stuff is very last minute. Like, sometimes we don't even know what we're shooting until the morning of. So I got to Croatia and then was told I had the first five days off. Go enjoy Croatia. We got you this really nice hotel room on the water. So I made the mistake wow. of texting my wife a picture of me with a pina colada and she was just... That was, I should not, then I had to make a whole thing about, no, it's really stressful and the scripts yeah. aren't coming in in time and I don't know, oh, I can't sleep. Really, I was just having <laughs> That's no. insane. But I always admire like, because we have not, we have like literally nothing. So it's always like. You guys shoot on the soundstage? Mostly. We do um, like a month and a half on a soundstage and then about a month on location. Um, so the motels and the cafes and the, the anything sort of inside is generally on a set. And then we sort of fake it by going to this like location. And um, it's been, I mean, it's really fun, but it's a, I mean, for us, just from, from a budgetary standpoint, like, you know, I was, offering to pay for music rights like myself just to get the songs in the show because it's just a, it's a totally different world and uh that was at the beginning know, I, though right like after a while no like, it never got better <laughs> it never got no i really because inherently the structure of the show is so small nobody expected it to do anything i mean other than just hopefully be a nice little comedy and i think for us the challenge was oh no, like season after season, people are starting to, to watch it. And then, you know, toward the last few seasons, you know, suddenly we're getting an Emmy nomination and people are looking around saying like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> uh, no one could... is like, is, is set up for this kind of uh, shift. Really? So particularly in the last season, you know, there was a pressure in that I knew that people were watching. I knew that I wanted the show to have a certain quality to it. You always want to improve season after season. So how do you stretch a budget that hasn't really changed that much since season one into mm -hmm. a show that people are now watching, you know, uh, on mass on Netflix or on, on pop, wherever they, they choose to watch it and expecting the kind of caliber show that you would get in a fifth or sixth season. Right. But when you don't have that budget, it's just like a lot of, it's like a lot <laughs> of gray hair going in for me and hopefully nobody <laughs> noticing. But you couldn't have been that surprised when it was getting that kind of attention. I mean, I, I started watching it right, I remember seeing the poster for it and going, when did this pop up? Why didn't I know about this? I want to see this show. Um, and my wife and I instantly fell in love with it. We're telling everybody, but it seemed that we were trying to tell people, you got to watch Shit's Creek. And everyone's like, yeah, I know, we're already watching it. Like, everyone was already on board with the show from, I felt, at least from my circle of people I know. People knew of it right away, loved it. Um, so you couldn't have been too surprised when it was getting the attention that it got. Or well, I mean, it? in a way, like, making that show was a 13 month process for me. Between like the writer's room, then we shot it, then I was in post for a really long time, like cutting it all together. So for those first, like, I would say the first half of the season series, I never really left like a small room without windows. So wow. to, to hear the trickle effects of like, oh, people are talking about it, or, you know, I, I remember Angelica Houston mentioned it, I think on, on some kind of uh, video clip. And I remember thinking, what? How are people seeing this? In the yeah. back of my mind? Like, I just didn't expect I don't know. I think when you start out really, really small, that's kind of the mentality you keep throughout the entire 
journey of it. You don't, you don't ever kind of, you obviously have high hopes. You hope that people enjoy it. You hope that people like it, but you know, when you're dealing with that small of a show, you, it's never in your head to think, oh, we're going to get an Emmy nomination. That's just not, right. I mean, I'm literally, it's like held together by tape and gum. Right. And also it's like, I guess when you're working on the job, you're focused on the job itself, not really how it's going to be perceived, right? I guess. Yeah. And especially from like a, a show running standpoint, I think the minute that you start to even care in a little bit about how people watch the show or who's watching it, or um, it shifts the way that you do your job. Um, and fortunately, yeah. we've had a very rare experience of never really having to worry about ratings because both our network in Canada and our network uh, in the States on, on pop were supportive of the show and basically told us from early on, like, we will keep this going as long as you want it to go. So we didn't ever have to compromise or do those weird kind of mid season cliffhangers that people have to do to like spark ratings. We were able to just slowly but surely roll out the stories of these people in ways that I felt really respected the characters and respected the, the craft of the arcs and things that we were trying yes. to build without having to worry about all the song and dance that I think a lot of shows have to worry about in terms of like, well, uh, we need more ratings. Yes. Um, well, let's, let's put a child in there. A really precocious yeah, little exactly. kid. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Add a kid. Yeah. But, um, but I think that's when, when you start pandering to an audience, any audience member's like, oh, they're, they're trying to give us, this. there's a show that I won't mention that recently had a great pilot and I was like, this, I'm not going to say what it is. I'll text you later. And I was like, this is a great pilot. And then by episode two, it was so aware of how good the pilot was that it just, <laughs> it was one of those, like, we know what we love about it now. Yeah. Say again? Especially when I find that to be in like second seasons of shows is when you start to understand, like people start to play into audience expectations and things. Mm -hmm. And in a way, as fun as that is, it separates you from actually watching the show because you're almost in a meta experience of being aware that the show is aware that I'm watching it. And I, yeah. you know, I think of all the shows that I've, I've really responded to and there's such great TV out there right now. Um, we're like in a wave of just very specific TV where I feel like creators who have visions are being given the runway to really execute their shows in, in ways that don't yeah. feel like too noted. You know what I mean? Right. I feel like, network notes often kind of shift or change or dilute the, the specificity of, of a show. And it really feels like, you know, the, the advent of kind of cable television and streaming services have really gotten behind promoting a vision over, we need a comedy about a person underwater, but we want it to be about, you know what I mean? It's like trying to yeah. like round hole square peg What's what's funny is is like you keep I've heard people say a lot because I, I think I would say that we're both in shows that are pretty successful at a time when there is just an insanely high volume of television. There's so much content out there, so people will say like you know it's it's like what you said. Um, people are sort of doing they're a little more untethered, and the sort of cream rises to the top a little bit. Um, which I'm just an actor in a show that people are doing. Like, you created a show that has gotten up there. That's got to feel really good. Because there's so much volume, and that really is you guys. Like, you even saying that you weren't, you weren't have to, you weren't, didn't need to fit in a little box. I don't know if I'm making sense here. I don't really speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I think, listen, I think it's, it, 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 it's a combination of, like, right time, right place, luck. I think, you know, to be putting out a show that ultimately is kind of promoting joy and kindness and acceptance and have that show coincide with a giant shift in American politics a few years ago, um, I do feel like there was a spike in viewership and people were responding to feel good TV in ways that they weren't necessarily before. If Kendall's going rogue, then let him. Sooner or later, it's gonna blow up in his face. I love it when it blows up in people's faces. You do? I do, it's my fucking favorite. I like how this is working. Us, I see a future here. A timely question for you. Mm -hmm. um,
what do you think your character would be doing in quarantine? I think... Let me preface nothing... this by saying, where, where would he be and what would he be doing? Where is a good question, actually. Yeah, because I don't think Roman would hold himself up in, in New York. Um, but Get I don't out. think he'd be on a yacht. I think he, this might be like a... Uh, firstly, I think he would not be doing anything as interesting as he would like people to think. I think he would be, you know, <laughs> tweeting and texting people that he's doing all sorts of stuff. But really, he's probably just pacing, being really bored. Um, right. And doing nothing. But he would probably be at one of, like, you know, daddy's estates or something. Okay. In the country. What do you think? Where do you think David would be? Um, probably pacing the front lawn of his new home. Um, just uh, it couldn't have come at a worse time for him. He's now a, a homeowner um, and trying to pay for that home with a store that, let's be honest, is not <laughs> busy at the best of times. Yeah. Uh, good point. Good point. So, I think there'd be some panic. He doesn't handle panic well. Um, so generally, I think the vibe in the house would be tense. Um, yeah. You know, just waiting it out. Wow, yeah, that's a... Not fun. Doesn't sound No, fun. that doesn't sound like a fun one. I think Roman would be no. handling it a little better than David. Yeah. Uh, um, how, how is Dan handling it, though, uh, to, compared to Kieran? Uh, well, what's, I... What's quarantine like for you? Listen, I think that it is so devastating and it's so tragic what's happening to people, to the economy, to people's employment, that honestly to be, you know, with a roof over my head and the ability to put food on the table, if you have those bare necessities down at this point, I really don't think there's much to complain about. Um, I know we were talking earlier about the idea of like, if you are bored, it's a luxury. Yeah. yeah. I would love to be bored, but I think you said the right thing. It's like, because I get really stressed sometimes. It gets really tense in this little apartment, you know, me, my wife, and the little baby that doesn't sleep. Like, it gets really intense, but it's that. It's like, but still, I have way too much food in the fridge. Like, there, yep. there are so many days where I say, maybe we're going to have to eat blank before it goes off. She doesn't eat it, so I s stuff it wherever I can. <laughs> I've eaten so much sausage in the last couple of days. Um, it, but, it is amazing, yeah. though, to, 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 to see over social media. I mean, people are, are talking about how bored they are and, and, and they're making banana bread to, like, alleviate the boredom. And I'm like, if you have just an abundance of ingredients to make a bread, clearly things are good for you. That's exactly what it is. I, 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 went, I was of one flour of those, I was one of those guys who hoarded at the beginning, and I feel really bad about it now. Um, because I was just like, I don't know what the world's going to look like. It's just, you know, all I know is my baby needs to eat, my wife needs to eat. If my wife doesn't eat, then no breast milk is produced. Like, I panicked, so I bought everything. Um, and now I'm a little wiser to the fact that grocery I stores have, are still going to be open. I have a, a pan, again, bought in a panic. I have a box of 80 tiny oatmeal packets. <laughs> what packets? Instant plan. People were going for vegetables. I was like non-perishables. Uh, 80 oatmeal packets. If I knew how to pick this thing up, I would show you there's a whole closet full of, oh, and then there's, there's a cabinet over there that's full of like dinty more beef stew and things that my wife would never touch, but like, like comforts from my childhood, like canned corned mm -hmm. beef hash and stuff that I picture myself like in an abandoned warehouse in a few years eating with a, my fingers, you know? A fingerless glove. Eating some food. Yeah. <laughs> it's a whole look. Exactly. The cats and the cat food, and now I'm on the corned beef hash. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, growing up because you grew up in this industry, and I want to uh, uh, friends of mine who uh, you know have have also been actors since a very since they were quite young. I was always curious to know how they navigated. Uh, a very professional and adult industry from a young age. And also, you know, I look at like uh, Igby Goes Down, which is such a great movie and I've seen it like 700,000 oh. times and you're so good at it. <laughs> um, handle it, I mean, it's like there's really heavy subject matter being thrown at you over the course of your whole life. Processing that as a, as a younger person 
um, even though it is acting, you're still kind of in a way living really dark kind of realities. Was it tough? Was it easy? How did you uh, navigate all of that that was sort of being thrown at you at a young age? Yeah, I mean, you obviously, like, at a young age, you wouldn't be able to analyze that. Even now, I don't know that I can really have that perspective. Um, it <laughs> wasn't, I can tell you, it wasn't really, like, an unpleasant journey for me. Uh, like, I don't, um, I remember being kind of fun uh, growing up doing the acting thing, but there were times when it was like, you know, I'm, I'm like nine, and I would be staying at the Sheridan Universal Hotel for three months um, while shooting Father of the Bride or something, and I'm there in the, an apartment that's, or a, a hotel room that's about like, you open the door, you trip over the bed, you fall in the toilet, and then I'm like there with my dad for three months. And my family's back home, like going to school, playing. But I'm never like missing that. I remember like hotel living and stuff like that. Like that was bad. But like being on set was always fun. Um, and one thing that like, because I don't think what I did as a kid is at all what I do now. Like like that mm -hmm. that wasn't acting. That was you know memorize your lines, show up on time, which means you know somebody else got me dressed and put me in a car. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's very different. For, but like I'm very thankful that I had that kind of experience growing up because I started my first job was when I was six, I guess. Um, and there's certain things that I did get from that. Like I memorize lines really fast, which isn't really like a talent. It's just like a little party trick. You can give me lines. No, like, no, it's three, it's a full blown talent. I I <laughs> cannot do that. So it's a it's a it's skill. A it's not a talent. Yeah. Okay. It's like a, like a party trick, like. I, I, I can get pages of dialogue and learn it in a few minutes. That doesn't mean I'm going to say them well. Like, it just doesn't mean right. that I know what okay. we're doing. Fair enough. Uh, Fair enough. But there's things like that from doing it from my childhood that it's just like, you know, those old skills. But, um, I don't know. What would be... So, I wanted to ask you mm -hmm. when you actually started acting. Because I know we've been talking about you as a showrunner and as a writer and everything like that, but I haven't actually talked to you about yeah. acting yet. When did you start that? Was that ever something you wanted to do? Yeah, I mean, I think that I was always like performing from a very young age, and uh, my dad has documented basically everything that I have done, uh, be it like a play that I staged in our basement to performances that I did with my cousins. Um, but it was never like a professional thing, it was always just something I did around the house. And then when I got into high school, we didn't really have a drama department, so I, along with some friends, ended up like writing, adapting, and producing and starring in in the school plays because no one else was doing it. Um, writing and adapting. Jesus. Yeah, we like did the whole thing because there was no drama department, so you had to. We adapted actually the um, the movie Clue for the stage. Um, oh wow! And it was a great. It was a really fun thing, and I ended up playing Mr. Green and. and later ended up working with Martin Mull, which was this whole sort of full circle moment. He was so uh, cool. <laughs> yeah, it was very, it was very cool. Um, but, you know, pro professionally, I think I got a job hosting at MTV uh, fresh out of, of, of school uh, and I dropped out, but that's fine. Um, the job you was dropped worth out of high it school? to me. Uh, no, high college, school? university. I got my job like three months before I was supposed to graduate, and um, it was an either or situation, and I, I, I took took a gamble. Um, but I was doing hosting for a long time, which was not acting at all. In fact, I think it's like a totally opposite discipline because it's free form, and you have questions, but there's there's a lot of like room to to play. And then, wait, sorry, you were doing what? What? For I was long? hosting at MTV. I was like a VJ. Holy MTV. shit! You yeah. were a VJ. See, this, this is why, like, I, I didn't. I'm glad I didn't do research. I'm like genuinely in, shocked. In Canada, and um, <laughs> you know, it was it was fun, but I just kept thinking, like, you're you're in a situation where you're asking people a lot of questions about what they're doing with their lives, and some people are very good at that, and I was not. And I think in the back of my mind, I just kept thinking, like, gosh, I want to do something that someone wants to ask me a question about one day. And when I left MTV, I started this, the idea for the show. I had acted kind of very sporadically. I did a movie, um, you know, um, just when I got to LA after, after MTV. 
Um, and um, this was my first kind of big opportunity. And um, it was intense. And I will say, Annie and I, Annie Murphy, who plays my sister Alexis on the show, yeah. she and she's I were brilliant. both like, she's so good. And we were yeah. both like very, very green. And for me, I hadn't really thought about the process of acting because I was spending so much time writing and prepping the show that the night before our first day of shooting, I had a full panic attack thinking, <laughs> I have to act with Catherine O'Hara and my dad tomorrow. I don't even know what I'm doing. I didn't even, had it not been for one movie that I did like a year and a half prior where someone had to explain to me what coverage was, I had to know <laughs> what, what was going on. And so Dude. Annie and I in that first day, like really just held on to each other and said, okay, we're both in this together. And fortunately, Catherine and my dad are so, wonderful in terms of mm -hmm. setting a tone on set that is so egoless and so much about the collaboration. And I realized how important that is in terms of getting great performances out of people. Because when you're not showing up to work worried about like, am I gonna do right. a good job or not? Because the environment is conducive to just playing around and experimenting and feeling comfortable in the skin of your character without any kind of ego anxiety to yeah. battle, um, you know, you end up doing okay. I mean, I'm not saying I'm doing good work, but I think just generally speaking for someone who had very little experience, I felt very comfortable very quickly. Yeah, um, which is key, which by the way, like you just explaining that was giving me so much anxiety. Like I don't even have room for more anxiety and you were giving me that on, on the front <laughs> or panic attack, you being like, oh wait, oh, so I have to act as well? And yeah. it's crazy for me to say that you guys were both, you, you and Anne Murphy were both really green, you said. That's yeah. nuts I mean, for me like, to see. I could I, count the jobs on a hand. Wow. It doesn't come off that way at all. Um, it actually seems Thanks. that you guys are really comfortable. That you, did you guys know each other for a long time or something? Did she no, just audition? I never. That's she insane. auditioned. We had uh, an instant kind of chemistry. Um, and again, I think it comes down to just being very lucky with your cast. I think if your cast is fully realized and the, and the actors are embodying their characters in, in ways that are really natural and and um, and substantial and feels like grounded and real and you don't have to a right to accommodate what someone's doing, you can end up writing for the person. That's right. the greatest thing. And that, I think, was what, what has been so helpful for me, even from season one of the show was like, yeah. we just, all of these people spoke a certain way, it became easier to write for them. Um, and when you don't have the looming threat of like a problematic personality on set that you're kind of having to like, ooh, you just get people ultimately just like blossom. So that's, that's, that's really key. The whole thing is like just being able to trust somebody in a room and you had that right out of the gate. Uh, or yeah, like, that's what it's like. And because I don't know, have you have you since then in six seasons experienced an actor that was very difficult or made it all about them or have you? No, I've been very lucky. But I also think too that when you are given the kind of uh, you know um, relative success that that I have, you then have the ability to kind of pick and choose what you want to do, um, which I think is ultimately the goal for any is to get to a point where you can say, I don't know, this doesn't feel right for me and I don't necessarily right. need to do it right now. I'm gonna choose putting myself in a situation that I think I'll have fun in over yeah. being, you know, raked over the coals for the potential of like an experience that may or may not turn out well. So wow. it's really kind of like illuminated an idea of just, I want to continually work with people that, um, are in it for the right reasons and who want to have fun and who you know yeah. want to do good work and, and check which it go at the door because yeah there's a, but like you I, I in my experience the majority of people are that but then you do get yeah. surprised sometimes when somebody comes in it's like the when you're working with a group of people that are all really excited they're nice and they create help create a safe environment and you can just throw stuff like in our show we have a lot of that there's a lot of like somebody will just say something and I go, okay, I guess we're doing this scene. Um, I didn't know we were, it was going to be like this. 
there, there was one scene where I showed up to the set, it was like the end of the day, and I was about to go on set to rehearse, and a PA, somebody came to me and said, uh, Jeremy would like to know if you just want to shoot instead of rehearse. It was, um, it's in the first season, there's a scene where he's getting high with like those guys he met at the bar. Mm -hmm. um, basically going to retrieve him. It's, this is like we're at New Mexico, whatever. And uh, I hadn't met those actors yet. I had no idea what the set looked like. Um, but I said, yeah, let's do it. So they rolled, they said, action. I knocked, I walked in. The first thing I did was look right at the camera because I didn't know where it was gonna be. But <laughs> I said, I remember I said my first line and whoever I said it to said something else entirely. And I was like, oh, okay, game on. And we just did that. We just basically said stuff, tried to sort of get dialogue in wherever we could, did that three or four times, and then they were like, okay, that's a wrap. Then I introduced myself to those other actors. Like, didn't even meet them. Wow. But that's like the kind of shit, but that was because we built a lot of trust in the entire crew that we can yeah. do that. Um, and so like- to, Did you find that that was really helpful or a challenge? Or both. I'm, I'm at this point. I'm just a little bit like, let's play. I don't know. Sometimes I show up to work and I get the sides. I'm like, oh, you guys rewrote it in the middle of the night. Um, and it's like <laughs> I walk into set and I have new lines. And I go, J and they're like, do you know your lines? I went, I don't know, man. Let's just roll it. <laughs> let's just see what happens. Right. It's fun. It's just fun. Yeah. Yeah. And when you get to well, do things, you know, with people that you trust, like I asked Sarah Snook like early on, like, do you mind if I slap you? She was like, yeah, sure. So I just like slapped her and then she beat the crap out of me. It was great. Like we just play. It's fun. The trust. Did you, was there a period because of because the chemistry is so um, palpable between all of you and because you know you're, you're coming from a family? Um, I know that like f for me on on our show, I met with Annie and a couple of the younger actors before we started shooting just to go through those first few days worth of scenes that we were shooting. And I, you know, I basically sat down and said, was there, is there anything that you're not feeling good about? Like, are, is there anything that in your bones, you're just feeling like, I wish I didn't have to say this, or this doesn't feel like how I so use my character. And in the process of doing that, we actually came up with some great um, alternate dialogue and jokes that the actors had brought, but it also brought us together. And I think there was a level of, um, ease that was set knowing that this wasn't going to be something where they were going to be scared to, to offer their two cents. But that to me was helpful for work, but also a bonding experience knowing that I was going to have to have chemistry with, with Annie in particular, that we were playing brother and sister. Was That's there really anything smart. that you guys did before shooting that like a get to know you kind of... <laughs> in my mind I'm thinking like trust exercises? How does... How does no, the what one, happens? so, no, I'd say when it comes to the cast, we didn't do anything like that, but when we shot the pilot again, it was sort of like, you know, this is a job, it might not get picked up, whatever. The one right. thing that I was terrified of, um, I met with Adam McKay, who produced it, and he directed the pilot, and he told me, he's like, oh, by the way, like, we're going to shoot, um, like, a take or two on script, and then we're just going to improvise, and I was like, excuse me, what? No, like, that's not... <laughs> Can you write my improv? Like, I don't do that. Uh -huh. um, and he was like, no, it'll, don't worry, it'll be fine. I'm like, I just came from like doing a play where it's like the playwright is like, you miss the comma, you have to hit the comma. And then if I hit right. the comma, it's like, he's right. I gotta, I gotta do the line structure. Um, so there was one day when, uh, on the pilot, it was like dad's birthday and we finished the scene, whatever it was. And then he had the cameras keep rolling and just said, all right, uh, go to, Alan, Alan, talk about your house. And Alan Ruck just started talking about like his ranch. I think he just made it up. Like he started talking about his ranch and how he used to get like water shit. I, I can't even remember. I remember being like, that's brilliant. Did he just come up with this? And then I saw the camera go to everybody else in that room in pairs and they were all able to do it. And the whole time I'm going, please run out of film. We were shot on film. Like just run out of film. Do not point these cameras at me. I'm not going to do it. And I remember he like, the, the cameras got to me and I tried to stall. I went, no thanks. And he, he was like, no, 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 just, just talk about anything. Like, oh, can you give me a subject or something? He was like, just talk. Went, oh my God. 
in my head I was just terrified, like, running the film. But I remember, like, I just said some terrible joke or something, and I was like, it, it like, freed me up, and it felt like I knew I could say a really bad joke and make an ass of myself, and he wouldn't use it, and he didn't, of course. And there was, like, this freedom that everybody can just sort of play. Uh -huh. And from there, once we got picked up, I think, playing with the other actors, there was a lot of, like, sometimes you just say stuff. Um, I forgot I did this, but Nick Braun just reminded me on the second season, he walked into a room, we were supposed to do a scene, and one take he came in, it was in the bathroom, I'm washing my hands, and he says he came in and said his line, and I just looked at him, and I just didn't say mine. And so then he just started talking, and I just didn't speak. And it was like, we ended up getting something really great, we didn't get used, but it ended up being like a fun banter that we can sort of just like do with each other, you know? Because you know, there's an opening. Yeah, see, no one sees me coming, but I am right on the shoulder. If Dad announces tomorrow, he announces me. Has to, there's no other option. I mean, it's fucking insane, but I am the best he's got. Yeah. Unless there is one other. Okay, so you talked about when you first started the show, you had, what was it, one movie you said, and then your experience as a VJ, or was it a couple of things? Yeah, it was a, it was a movie, it was a, it was a movie, a TV movie, and a, a guest appearance in Degrassi, which I don't know if you're aware of Degrassi, the next generation. I'm aware of it, yes. Um, <laughs> but a, 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 but you, a lovely, shimmering Canadian television gem. But it's like things like, okay, so when I talked earlier about like, my doing it since I was six years old meant like, I know what coverage yeah. is, I know what hit my mark without looking at it, and the technical things, but the acting stuff came like later. With you, it was like, you didn't even know the technical bits. Now you're running a show that you're acting in um, and you're, you're writing, but you got to build this, like, world of trust. Was improv, like, something, was improv something you studied, or were you just, like, starting with the dialogue and then going, oh, these people are playing, I'm gonna play too? Yeah. No, I mean, I would say we're about 75% scripted and then 25% improv. I think, you know, when you're working with uh, like Catherine O'Hara or my dad who have come from Second City and, mm -hmm. you know, all of the Christopher Guest films, you know, even though my dad and, and, and Chris, you know, sort of outlined those movies, they were improv. Mm -hmm. And I look at those movies and I think like, I have the same reaction that you have, which is if someone pointed a camera in my face after, you know, Catherine's drunk rant at the Chinese restaurant in Waiting for Guffman, I would be completely fro- I mean, I wouldn't know what to possibly yeah. say. Um, so I think when you're dealing with people who are so gifted at, at, a, at a skill like improv or, or just like the general kind of character work that they do, you have to, th I think, leave room for those kind of, the kind of spontaneity that they, that they bring to whatever they do. And I think, you know, the, the great thing about working with, with Catherine and my dad is that they've personalized so much of the work that they've done in the past. You know, I remember my dad um, getting the script for American Pie and um, passing on it because, you know, A, it was like about a kid who was having sex with a pie. And I remember thinking like, what is this movie? Where, what are you talking about? And then I guess in the process of like meeting the directors, which was Paul and Chris Weitz at the time, um, he proposed a kind of alternate version of what his character was. I guess the character originally was... Um, was a little bit harder and like gave his son porn or something. And then in, in what my dad sort of decided to do was soften the character and have him be a little more uncomfortable about the world of, of, of talking to sex with your child. And um, in a way, I think that's what those two have brought to every movie is a level of kind of intimacy and, and a personalization to the character work that is so uniquely their own. So for us, it was like the openings and the closings of scenes we would shoot it as is we would listen to any comments that cast or crew had in terms of like trying to make the scene as good as it possibly was and then we do you know we, what, what i like to call a little button at the end of the scene which is if someone's leaving a room or if there's like a little thing that's happening banter between people you just mm -hmm. let it run and i don't think catherine has done a single take the same in the six years that we shot the show every single take was different and you okay. never knew what you were going to get. And I remember shooting the uh, pilot, the first episode of our show. She has lost her bracelet, I think, or a necklace. 
and she's running around the motel room and opens a drawer and pulls out a light bulb and makes a like ah, sound. And if you notice in the scene, I'm covering my face like this because I couldn't <laughs> keep myself from laughing. I physically could not stop laughing. And every time she, we did this take, we had to walk in the room and I would see her in these various states of insanity. And I couldn't, so I made the choice to drift for, at least it looks like I'm shocked or disturbed. But it was such, I mean, there were moments shooting the show where you realize, oh, you're working with someone that is absolutely brilliant. And the choices that they make and the decisions that they make in a scene, this kind of electricity that they bring to their work, the spontaneity, you realize, oh, this is like, we're part of something special and I'm getting to watch someone who is the best of the best do what they do best. Yeah. So for us, it was really like, write Moira as best as we possibly could, but really just clear the room so that Catherine could do what Catherine does best. And did, did you consider yourself like crazy lucky when she was on board? Was that something you already knew you were gonna get her on board or did that take some time? She didn't, she was originally not wanting to do it. Um, and it took us a minute to, to, my dad had, you know, we had done a presentation pilot for the show and she had agreed to do it. And we said, don't worry, you don't have to do, it's just for the presentation. Obviously the show gets picked up to series and we have to place the call to her and say, so, um, so it's, it's we have a 13 episode pickup would you be interested in reprising the role? And I think at the time, the idea of committing to TV was, it was intimidating for her. I think she had previously just been doing, you know, movies where she got to come and go and, and wasn't necessarily tied to something for a long period of time. And it finally got down to a, a, a place where she had passed and I had a pep talk with my dad because I didn't have that closeness with her. And I said, okay, Go back to her one last time. He said, I'm not doing that. I said, yes, you are. You're going to call her <laughs> again. And you are going to say, all it is is a first season. If you do the first season and you hate it, we will not continue with the show. We will write the character out. We will do anything that you want to make you feel comfortable to commit to a single season of this show. Let's just do it one season at a time. Because at the end of the day, if, if, you know, if one of the leads in your show doesn't want to be doing the show, yeah. Chances are the show's exactly. not going anywhere anyway. So yeah. she finally agreed. I remember my dad calling me back after the pep talk saying she said yes. <laughs> I was like, we did it. Um, that is and such a great yeah. get. She is, I think I told you this in that, in that like 10 minutes that we hung out that one time. I think I told you this, but she is responsible in your show for making me laugh like one of the hardest I've ever laughed in my life. And to the point where I, I actually was on the floor and it, it was actually, it started getting to a point of being unpleasant how hard I was laughing because it was hurting. <laughs> my wife was laughing at me. She was in tears just at my laughter. And it was the bit when she's doing the commercial for the wine and she's very drunk. There was something that was so painfully real about this very drunk woman who's trying to act sober and she's nailing it. She actually is coming off almost sober. If you didn't know any better, mm -hmm. you would think this woman has it together. And then at the very end, she slurs into this. It, it blew my mind. Like somebody that drunk playing sober. Brilliantly. Nobody plays Ever drunk seen. better than Catherine O'Hara. Nobody, <laughs> there is not a single human actor on the planet that can play drunk with the level of complexity struggle, nuance that Catherine, can, I mean, there is, mm -hmm. and she, I mean, we've, we've asked her time and time again to like share the secret of it. And she was like, it's just a matter of not wanting to be drunk. Yeah. So being that's it. constantly focusing on trying to be sober. And I, I mean, I, I later bookending that scene, which to your point, when we were shooting that scene, I was behind the camera watching it. And I did feel like if nothing else comes of the first season of this show, this scene is magic. And what she was able to do in that moment is so special. But six, you know, our sixth season, I ended up writing a scene uh, 
we, we ended up sort of building the scene where Catherine and I get drunk again at the wine place. Yeah. Um, and it was this like full circle moment. And I remember again, night before thinking, how, maybe I just shouldn't be drunk. Maybe I should rewrite the whole scene. Catherine can play drunk, but I'm certainly not playing like, what am I doing? Sharing a, camp, sharing a frame with Catherine drunk and me trying to keep up. It was the hardest day on set. It was trying to just, trying to just not, Keep up. not mess up what she was doing. How did you, how did you feel in the end? Did you end up, because you were nervous the night before, did you feel like, okay, we did it. I gotta tell you, I, I think, saw it and I thought it was great. You were escorted it, out. We were escorted out. It, you know, I think all you try to, you walk away, I think particularly in those moments when you're doing like bigger choices, um, that's when I always sort of walk away and think like, I think it was fine, but honestly, I have no idea. And the beauty of editing is that if it's not fine, you get to trim that <laughs> right out. And you can't have those dreams here? And some friends left there. The friends who you invited to the wedding? To name a few, yes. David, they're not coming. Apparently there was an electronic music festival in Norway that took priority. So you have a very unique experience going into this. Like, that this is, you know, you you had a couple of jobs, Degrassi, and you did, like, all that stuff. And now, all of a sudden, you're in charge of everything. You're acting in a really safe environment, but you're also in charge of the editing. I have to just completely rely on, I go home and go, man, that was awful today. I hope they don't use it. And, <laughs> like... Pretty much almost every single time on our show, when I'm like, that was bad, it's not in the show. Like, they, they have an eye, so I trust their eye. Yeah. Like, almost well, that's, every I think time, it really, I'm like, that's great. That's great, though. I think, you know, it's the people who are obviously making those decisions know the show, and they know your yeah. character, and they know what works, and they know what doesn't. Uh, you know, I think um, so much is done in, in edit, obviously. You're, you know, you're very lucky to be working with, like, incredible actors, but you're also able to really sculpt moments and, uh, and lift, elevate, change, manipulate um, a lot in the edit suite. And that was another thing that I was just sort of, you know, I went to film school, so I had experience in, in kind of what the craft of editing was. But it's been really fascinating. And I think, you know, for me going into the edit suite with the performances that I know we have, and it's, it's always fun to, to write our show because I, I love to give our actors like a lot to do. And the first thing that I love doing in those, in those first few days in edit is like going to those sort of really big moments that I think are really exciting and looking at what we have and then kind of shifting and shaping, you know, how can we make this even bigger or more impactful? So um, it's a really, wonderful comprehensive experience and um it also leaves yeah. you like constantly feeling like you have to do everyone's job for them so i just shot, uh, a movie. Really? I shot a movie in february and i was couldn't be happier uh, like thrilled to be there friends with everybody and at one point someone turned to me and was like um you're like in a really good mood all the time and people seem to really like you like um is everything okay <laughs> And I, I turned to them and I said, I'm only doing one job. This is the greatest job of my life. I have to just learn some lines and show up. This is, I'm not leaving set to write another scene. This is heaven. I was going to ask that because like now, because you have, but also there must be something free. Yeah. But there must be something a little scary of having no safety net of, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be in the editing room later and I can take care of something. Like you're giving right. that to some other director, some other editor. And if you go home and you think maybe I tanked it, it's probably going to be in the movie. And then you're just going to have to sit there and take it. Like, is there <laughs> that fear? like, like I blew it and that's it. There's no going back. Well, fortunately I was, um, I, I really love, it was with Clea Duvall who had written and directed it. And, um, she's so lovely and we had met before just to talk about it. And I think, you know, trusting the people you're working with is so key and, um, just knowing that you have that safety net of just trust and, and that they have good taste. And, um, 
I think that's, you know, it's been a, a lovely kind of um, shift in, in employment, really, because you get to a point where it was like, I was, part of why I wrote the show was because I was just so bad at auditioning. That it was really? like, I'm never, I'm never going to get a job. So all I can <laughs> hopefully do is write something for myself to like, it's, at least showcase what a fiber of talent, if I even have that, TBD. Um, right. Yeah. It's funny. It, nobody, nobody likes auditioning. And no, I don't know that anybody is even particularly good at it. Maybe people are. But like, when I realized that like, auditioning is, you're not actually doing the job. It's, it, the audition is its own completely separate thing. Then, if you can book the job, it's just an idea. Then you can actually do it. You're just trying to present yourself in a certain way. It's, and it's, it's an entirely different yeah, skill set too. It is a full, yeah. unique skill set of um, repressing anxiety and fear and overthinking things and walking in and meeting strangers you don't know and being vulnerable in front of people you don't know, which I guess is act, is acting. But yeah. the, the anxiety and the nerves of auditioning are something that I deal with like personally every day. I'm like an anxious, socially anxious person. So uh, okay. the process of auditioning is just is that it's like taking your worst fears and like heightening it to a degree where I'm yeah like, they could have like I, I remember being like 16 or something like at the most awkward phase and I had to do an audition in a room that was about the, about the size of a closet and I had to open up about how I'm in love with this girl and I really want to kiss her and the person that I was reading with was this 50 year old bearded man that I was like two feet from and I had to look at him like he was a 14 year old girl 15 year old girl whatever and, and really like be in love and enamored and I couldn't do it and I freaked out. There's also moments like, you know, I feel like the whole auditioning thing is set up to make you freak out. Um, I remember like I just turned 30 and I was auditioning for something where I'd be a lawyer and I was sitting in the room and there were all these other actors that were like men that were in suits that had like haircuts on purpose but like shape, and I had like long hair. I was wearing a Hulk Hogan t-shirt and jeans thinking like, I don't need to dress up. And I saw these like men go in an audition. I was like, I'm never gonna get this. Look at me, I'm a Hulk Hogan t-shirt, a lawyer? Like I'm gonna walk in there and pretend to be a lawyer? And obviously I tanked, I, you know. The situations <laughs> are like <laughs> terrible. Like, yeah. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about like comfort levels and, and environments that are conducive to feeling like liberated and uh, and free. Um, I want to talk to a little bit about um, Roman's relationship with Jerry um, mm -hmm. in the show and how, how it, were there conversations before that in terms of like comfort levels and like I'm gonna this is how what walk me through that relationship and how okay. the two of you have managed to to pull off the strangest, most wonderful relationship on television. <laughs> well, I've known Jay for years, actually. So she wasn't in the pilot. So I remember when um, the character of Jerry, reading the character of Jerry, which was initially written to uh, be a man, but she auditioned. And I was like, when I saw Jay, I was like, oh, I know her. Like, I'm really good friends with her and her husband. Um, so this will be fun. And during the first season, I just sort of kept um, sort of poking her. Jay is like really professional, like she's insanely talented, but she's also like really professional. So I like to like throw in a really inappropriate like fart joke or something like stupid to throw her off or like a boner joke or something just to like mess with her a little bit. And then she would, her thing would be like rolling her eyes at me and stuff. So I started doing this thing about halfway through the first season where I just started being like really raunchy and gross sexually forward with her. Like, uh, as Roman to Jerry, and her response was always... And was that a choice that you were making? Was that yeah, scripted? Yeah. It wasn't scripted, but it also wasn't in the show. Like, if you watch the first season, it's not there. It was just messing around okay. to try to make people behind the camera laugh and to try to make Jerry right, 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 right. which she almost never breaks. So, but what I was told by um, Mark Myla, who directs, like, almost half the episodes, he's one of the producers of the show, uh, Mark is fantastic. But he told me that he was in the edit for the, either the last or second to last episode. And apparently I said something really like gross sexual to Jerry and she like rolled her eyes. And I walked away and I checked out her butt. And then, and, but she didn't see. And then when I turned around, she checked out my butt and I didn't know that. He saw that in the edit and he was like, oh, these guys, okay, there's a thing here. 
and sort of suggested that maybe they like write it in and try it. And what happens a lot with this show is they just like throw stuff on the wall, see if it works. And a lot of times it doesn't, a lot of stuff doesn't make the edit. Um, there have been whole storylines that like, I remember I was talking about in interviews and then I saw the episode air and I'm like, oh, they cut that entire storyline because it wasn't mm. working. So I think with this, they kind of like played with it and been like, oh, maybe let's see if Roman and Jerry have any sort of anything, see if anything's interesting there. And now I'm, you know, I think I've masturbated <laughs> three times on the show, um, twice with Jerry, so. That's really when fun. I saw you, I was at, I was trying to get some intel on the on the season, and you were like, "Well, I masturbate a lot," and I remember thinking, "Okay." Then I watched the season, and I was like, "That's the tip of the iceberg in terms of things that you do on this show." <laughs> um, and I, my I, mom I, watches the show. Just before we we wrap this up, um, you were about to shoot the third season in April. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. April. So have you, do you, do you have any idea of where you're going? Do you have any thing you could... T people, people get mad. I've heard, I've, I've talked to people that are like, tell me you already shot it. I'm like, no. They're like, you're halfway through, we're going to get some episodes. Like, no, we were just about to start. And people are mad. Like, I, people get mad at me because we're not shooting the show. I know. Um, no. All, all I know, we have these conversations that like, Here's what we know, and here's what we don't know. We know nothing, but we like that. That's the conversation. It's like all I know is like maybe we might start shooting in September or not. I'm just as eager to get back to the show as, as anyone who might want to watch it. Well, I'm. I obviously can't wait, and you know, it's it's it, it, this whole thing is an interesting thing in terms of the industry, and I, I you know, I, I, my dad and I have had this conversation multiple times now if our show had been shooting right now we would have been done like we would just never have I, shot it you guys would have figured it out i bet you anything Derek, like, you could have shot your whole show on zoom and you would have made it fucking work sorry for the fuck you I, don't think so no i think the show would have done i think it we would not have been able to afford it we wouldn't have been able to afford to change the shooting schedule it would have been awful like, you know, so in a way so you it was like- got there just in time. I feel like, you know, there was a lot of people that have that are mad at me for ending our show. And I just keep thinking like, I, in a way I'm very glad that we did. Cause if we decided yeah. to do a season seven, we would have just left on a, a cliffhanger and you'd never find out what happened ever again. <laughs> the show would just be done evaporating. Can I ask, can I ask you, I mean, other than sitting in quarantine with your dog and waiting, yeah. uh, do you know what's sort of next for you? Yeah, um, I'm developing some stuff right now. So, you know, I think being a writer, it's actually a really motivating thing to know that like, the more that I write and the more that we try and get things made, the more that people will be employed when this all passes. So that's actually been keeping right. me going is like, I'm doing, a, you know, writing a couple pr projects right now that I'm really excited about. And, you know, the, the hope is, that with every script comes a crew of people that can make that script happen. And that's a crew of people who are in need of jobs right now. So, um, yeah, so just know, I think once let me know who I'm playing and uh, we'll, we'll, get it, we'll get it going. Don't even tease. Do not even tease. <laughs> It'll happen. <laughs>